Tenerife is one of the most visited islands in the world. It's part of the Canary Islands, a Spanish archipelago that sits just off the northwest coast of Africa. It has year-round sunshine, beautiful beaches, and some of the best weather on Earth. So, it's no surprise that over 5 million tourists flock to the island each year. They come for the sun, stay for the good times, and leave with memories that last a lifetime. But they're not the first. The island has been welcoming visitors for thousands of years. The earliest evidence we have of human activity on Tenerife dates back to around 600 BC, when the Guanches, an ancient tribe of people, settled on the island. They lived here in relative peace until the Spanish began exploring the area in the 15th century. Tenerife is home to Mount Teed, Spain's tallest volcano. It's so tall in fact that if you were to measure its height from its base on the ocean floor, it would be the third tallest mountain on Earth. Only Mount Everest and Kilimanjaro would tower above it. But Tidy isn't just any ordinary volcano. In fact, it's a very special kind of volcano. You see, it's what's called a shield volcano. That's different from your classic explosive volcanoes like Mount Vesuvius or Mount St. Noggins. Instead of being steep and pointy, shield volcanoes are wide and flat, like a warrior's shield, hence the name. And Tide is no exception. Its slopes are so gentle that you could literally roll a snowball down them without it falling apart. But don't let that fool you. Just because it doesn't look like it's gonna blow its top, doesn't mean it can't blow its top. And blow its top it did. It was about 27,000 years ago, give or take a few thousand. One day the volcano rumbled awake after a nap that had lasted tens of thousands of years. Lava bubbled up from deep within its guts and oozed out of a crack in its side. It flowed for 18 hours covering the surrounding landscape in a thick layer of new rock. Then it stopped. And for a while, there was only silence. But the volcano wasn't finished yet. Oh no. About 10,000 years later, it erupted again, this time with even more force than before. The lava flowed for 48 hours straight covering even more ground. And when it was done, the volcano had created a brand new landscape. New land, new mountains, new valleys, new everything. And on that new land sat a new mountain. It was taller than the one that had come before. In fact, it was the tallest mountain on the island, maybe even the tallest on Earth. But then something strange happened. The Earth began to shake. Not just a little rumble, but a big, full-on shimmy. The mountain shuddered as if it were coming down with a bad case of the shivers. Then slowly, ever so slowly, it began to tilt. At first it was barely noticeable, but over the course of a few days, it became impossible to ignore. People felt the ground beneath their feet shift and slide, and when they looked up, they saw the mountain had literally moved. It had tilted forward by about 25 degrees, sliding down the southeast side of the island and crashing into the ocean. When it hit the water, it created a massive landslide that wiped out everything in its path. Entire villages were lost under tons of rock and mud. People who lived through it told stories of entire neighborhoods that vanished overnight, swallowed up by the mountain. Those stories were passed down for generations until they became part of the island's folklore. But it wasn't just the landslide that changed Tenerife forever, it was also the mountain itself. You see, when the mountain slid off the island, it left behind a huge hole, a massive caldera that stretched from one side of the island to the other. Over time, the ocean filled in the hole, turning it into a lake. And that lake, my friends, is the thing that really changed Tenerife forever. It's called Lake Tide, and it's one of the highest elevation lakes in the world. You see, when Tide first erupted, it didn't create just one mountain, but two. The original peak remained, but the lava that flowed out of the volcano's side formed a new mountain at its base. This new peak was smaller than the original, but it was still pretty darn tall. In fact, it was so tall that when the mountain slid off the island, it didn't quite make it all the way down. The top stayed put, forming a natural dam that held back the rising waters. And that dam created a lake. A lake so high up, in fact, that it's perpetually covered in clouds. And those clouds are no joke. They're so thick and so heavy that they keep the area around the lake perpetually shrouded in mist. Even today, we don't know exactly what's down there. But we do know this. The lake is home to some seriously cool stuff like unique species of plants and animals that nowhere else on Earth. We've found frogs that can only be seen in the clouds, spiders that spin webs out of fog, and flowers that bloom in colors we never knew existed. In fact, the entire area around the lake is a UNESCO World Heritage Site because it's home to so much unique life, but it's not just the wildlife that's special. The whole area is just, well, magical. There's something about being up here in the clouds that makes you feel like you're on another planet. Maybe it's the mist that rolls in and out or the silence that hangs heavy in the air. 
Whatever it is, it's hard to explain, but once you experience it, you never forget it. And yeah, that's why we go to places like this. It's not just to get away from it all, but to get to somewhere that feels like it's out of this world. To be honest though, when the mountain slid down the island, it wasn't just the lake that formed. It also created a bunch of new peaks. In fact, it created so many new peaks that it completely reshaped the island. Some of the peaks are small, and some are pretty big, but one of them stands out from the rest. It's called El Taid, and it's the highest point on the island. But it's not just a pretty peak. No, sir. El Taid is a national park, and that's because it's home to so much unique life. I mean, we're talking about plants and animals that you won't find anywhere else on Earth. There's the Canarian Island Pine, a type of pine tree that grows in the clouds. And there's the blue-throated bee-eater, a kind of bird that looks like a tiny rainbow. The park is also home to all kinds of other wildlife, including more than 100 species of birds, 30 species of reptiles, and 17 species of mammals. But it's not just the wildlife that makes this place so special, it's also the rocks. See, El Tade is made up of a bunch of different types of rocks. There's basalt, which is a dark, heavy rock that's full of iron and magnesium. And there's trachyte, which is a light, airy rock that's full of gas bubbles. And then there's rhyolite, which is a shiny, glassy rock that looks like it came from outer space, and that's because it kind of did. You see, rhyolite is made when magma from deep inside the earth gets blasted up through the crust. It's so hot that it melts the rock around it, turning it into a hot, bubbly liquid. Then it cools and hardens, leaving behind a shiny black rock that looks like glass. El Tide is home to the largest area of rhyolite on earth. That's why it's such a popular spot for geologists. They come from all over the world to study these rocks and try to figure out how they got there. But even if you're not a geologist, you'll still appreciate the beauty of these rocks. They're so unique and so otherworldly looking that they've been used in movies like Star Wars and Harry Potter. In fact, there's a scene in Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows Part 2 where Ron and Hermione are running through the forest and they come across a clearing. And in the middle of the clearing is a bunch of these black shiny rocks. It's a small but striking visual that's become iconic among fans of the series, but it's not just the rocks that are special. The whole area is just, well, magical. There's something about being up here in the clouds that makes you feel like you're on another planet. I mean, the air is so thin and the silence is so profound that it's almost deafening. And when you look around, you realize that you're surrounded by nothing but rock and sky. It's hard to describe the feeling, but it's something that everyone should experience at least once in their life. The silence is broken only by the wind as it whistles through the rocks and the occasional cry of a bird. There's no cars, no people, no noise. It's just you and the rocks and the sky. And in that moment, you realize that you're truly alone. But you're not just alone in the physical sense, you're also alone in the cosmic sense. When you're up here on top of a mountain that's thousands of feet above the earth, you get a sense of perspective. You realize just how small you are in comparison to the vastness of the universe, and that can be a humbling experience. But it's also a beautiful one because when you realize how small you are, you also realize how big the world is, and that's something to celebrate. But it's not just the rocks and the isolation that make El Tade so special, it's also the history. The park is home to all kinds of old buildings and ruins, from ancient castles to abandoned farms. There's even a village that was destroyed by a volcanic eruption in the 19th century. These ruins are a reminder of the island's turbulent past, of the eruptions and earthquakes and tsunamis that have shaped its history. But they're also a reminder of the people who have lived here over the centuries, of the farmers and herders and whalers who have made their homes here despite the danger. To be honest though, when the mountain slid down the island, it wasn't just the lake and the peaks that formed, it also created a whole new culture, you see, when the landslide hit, it wiped out everything in its path. Entire villages were lost, people were killed, and the island was forever changed. The people who lived through it had to rebuild their lives from scratch, and in doing so, they created a new culture, one that was shaped by the disaster, but also by their resilience. For example, the Guanches developed a unique style of architecture that was designed to withstand earthquakes and volcanic eruptions. They built their houses out of stone and wood, and they built their walls extra thick to keep their families safe. They also developed a unique style of farming that allowed them to grow crops on the island slopes. They built terraces that held back the soil and prevented landslides, and they planted drought-resistant crops that could survive the island's harsh climate. But it wasn't just their architecture and their farming that changed. 
their art and their music also took on a new style. They began to incorporate images of the volcano into their artwork, and they began to sing songs about the disaster and their survival. In a way, the landslide became part of their identity. It was a defining moment in their history, and they embraced it, even in the darkest of times. The people of Tenerife are a strong and resilient bunch. They've endured earthquakes and volcanic eruptions, droughts and famines, but through it all, they've held on to their culture and their traditions. They've passed down their stories and their songs and their dances from generation to generation, and they continue to thrive today. So yeah, that's the story of how Tade changed Tenerife forever. It's a story of destruction and creation, of loss and resilience. It's a story that's been told and retold for generations, and it's a story that's still being written today.